There was this man named Alfred Russell Wallace, who was basically the sidekick to Charles Darwin. Okay, maybe that's a bit of an exaggeration, but Wallace definitely doesn't get the recognition he deserves for his contributions to the theory of evolution. See, Wallace and Darwin actually worked together on the idea of natural selection and even presented their findings together in London. But Darwin beat Wallace to the punch with his book on the origin of species, so poor old Wallace became just a footnote in history. Not cool, Darwin. Anyway, despite not getting the credit he deserves for his role in the theory of evolution, Wallace did make some pretty cool discoveries on his own. One of his best-known findings is something called the Wallace Line. Now, the Wallace Line is not actually a physical line that you can see on a map. It's more like an invisible boundary that separates the animal and plant species on either side of it. This boundary runs between the Australian islands and the Asian mainland, and it marks the point where there is a difference in the species found on either side. Basically, to the west of the Wallace Line, you'll find species that are similar to or derived from species found on the Asian mainland. But to the east of the line, there are many species that are unique to Australia. And along the line itself, you'll find a mix of the two types of species. It's like a game of genetic tug-of-war, with both sides pulling in different directions. This invisible line also has an impact on the geological landforms in the area. By looking at the shape and size of the continental slope and shelf, scientists can predict which types of species are found on either side of the line. Think of it as a secret code that only animals and plants in the area know how to decipher. More so, the islands near the Wallace Line are collectively called Wallacea, in honor of Alfred Russell Wallace. Even the birds that live on these islands seem to have stayed put over long periods of time leading to the development of unique species. If they could speak, they'd all be saying, nope, sorry, can't fly over the Wallace line today, gotta stick to our side. It turns out that there are more than 220 different mammal friends who call this place their home, and 125 of them are totally unique to the area. Some of these unique species include the dwarf buffalo and the deer pig, which is basically a taller, skinnier, and hairless version of a pig or wild boar. But it's not just mammals that make the Wallacea special. Nope, there are also over 200 types of reptiles in the area too. 100 of the lizards and snakes you'll find here can't be found anywhere else on Earth. It's the only place on Earth where you can find the Komodo dragon. This amazing creature is the biggest lizard on the planet and is sure to give you a menacing stare down if you ever encounter one. So how many species do we share our planet with? I mean, it's a pretty straightforward question that seems like we should have a good answer to, right? We just have to list and count all the animals, insects, birds, and other creatures we've discovered so far. Well, the truth is, it's a question that has stumped even the world's top scientists. Now, before we get into the nitty-gritty of how many species we know about, let's start with what we do know. Official data says that there are over 2 million species that we've identified and named. That's a lot of different creatures. But it's important to note that these numbers are constantly changing. Sometimes, scientists discover that two different names actually refer to the same species, so they need to combine them. Other times, they realize they've accidentally given two different names to the same species. Whoopsie! So, if we take into account these synonyms, we might actually only have about 1.7 million unique species that we've identified so far. But, regardless of the actual number, we know that we haven't even come close to finding all the different kinds of species that exist on our planet. That means that there could be many more types of creatures out there that we don't even know about yet. And unfortunately, some of these species may be in danger of going extinct before we even discover that they exist. Some estimates say there could be as few as 3 million, while others say there could be as many as 100 million. That's quite a range! Of course, it's also hard to say for sure because there are so many different types of species out there. From large animals like elephants, whales, and giraffes, to small insects, and even fungi. Don't even get me started on microscopic bacteria and viruses. 
One way that scientists try to estimate the total number of species is by looking at the relationships between different groups of species. This way, they can use the patterns that we do know to make educated guesses about the actual numbers of species in lesser known groups. The answer to the question of how many species we share our planet with is… we don't really know. But isn't that kind of exciting? It means that there's still so much more for us to discover and learn about the incredible diversity of life on Earth. This amazing biodiversity leads us to this next question. There are many species of canines, for instance. There's your average golden retriever or beagle, but those pups come from a whole different species from their wilder canine cousins, like wolves, coyotes, or even foxes. But how come there are no other human species roaming around our planet? Not too long ago, we shared this planet with some pretty clever and resourceful species of humans. How come only Homo sapiens made it through? If some scientists are to be believed, all the different human species that ever existed were descended from ape-like creatures that walked upright in Africa over 6 million years ago. One of the earliest human species, Homo ergaster, appeared in Africa 2 million years ago. They were skilled hunters and even made tools. Plus, their bones suggest they were excellent runners. These humans evolved during a long and terrible drought that turned tropical rainforests into large deserts. But don't worry, they were equipped to deal with the heat since they were largely hairless and could sweat more efficiently. Eventually, other human species called Homo erectus emerged and left Africa to spread across Asia. They were small groups of hunters and gatherers that moved around a lot to get their food ahead of the competition. Sound familiar? That's because they were very similar to us in terms of their body shape and build. Fast forward to around 120,000 years ago, when Homo sapiens also left Africa and began spreading out. Some went to Europe while others headed east and arrived in India, just in time for a massive volcanic eruption that covered a huge area with ash. Over time, Homo erectus was slowly driven out, probably due to a combination of changes in their climate and competition for food. But here's the thing. Homo erectus was actually slightly bigger and more powerful than Homo sapiens. Why did we thrive while well, they did not? Well, turns out that it's not all about overall brain size. It's more about the areas of the brain that are larger. Homo erectus did not allow much brain space to the part that controls language and speech, which is a crucial element for Homo sapiens' ability to communicate and spread new ideas. With our complex planning, language skills, and ability to trade, Homo sapiens were able to develop better tools, like the spear, which could be thrown for hunting and fighting. We outcompeted other human species, like Neanderthals, who couldn't keep up with the changing environment. And now, here we are, the only surviving human species on the planet. It's pretty amazing when you think about it. There's such a huge gap between us and our nearest primate relatives. And if there were other human species still around, we might not feel so special. Maybe a little dose of humility wouldn't hurt, huh?